to tell you guys about uh, my moderator. I've known Cody Bass for a long time, and everybody loves him, and for a very good reason. Uh, he's brought a lot of farmers into compliance, and he's responsible for so many people's livelihoods. He's so professional. He's so nice. He's so cool. Super handsome. And he's going to be the next Lake Tahoe City Councilman. He also owns a dispensary, one of the best up there. Cody Bass. Wow, well thank you Susan for uh, such a great introduction. Um, we've got a great panel together today uh, to discuss CBD, which is such a hot topic and, and there's a lot to discuss. Uh, we've got pretty much from every kind of angle, um, we, we've got an amazing researcher here, we've got a patient that uh, every day is involved uh, with using CBD to heal the, the ailments that uh, CBD can be so great for so many things. Um, We've also got a, a Jessica that is involved in making uh, products and, and developing products with CBD, uh, and Nick who consults in the industry uh, and can actually uh, build the platforms and, and build outs to derive and, and produce CBD. Um, I did real quick though want to go into uh, the reasons and, and kind of something that came to me uh, today and throughout this event. Uh, of why we all need to still hold a medical recommendation. Um, we're ironically dealing with it at this event uh, straightforward with the fact that they're trying to say that we cannot medicate. And they point to Prop 64 and the fact that Prop 64 says you cannot smoke in public places. Um, the fact is top, Prop 215 is, is still a law voted on by the people uh, and it absolutely authorizes us to medicate anywhere else you can smoke uh, tobacco and if you can smoke tobacco you can you can smoke your medicine if you hold a recommendation if, if you're smoking cannabis as a 21 and up recreational uh, consumer then then no prop 64 says you cannot smoke in public places but um, the thing is though on private property they do have the right to tell anybody to leave their private property and, and of course your recommendation is not going to override that but this came to me and, and Susan talked to me about it and I think it's something that we all need to remember is that we do still have our medical rights uh, and we should absolutely all have a recommendation so that uh, you know we don't get into this this argument in the future and um, so wanted to bring that up first um, so first I think the, the most important thing to do is we'll go down the line and let everybody introduce themselves and uh, and give a little background and uh, and we'll take it from there hello everyone or should I say hi my name is Jessica Asoff, and a few years ago, I, after getting my MBA at Harvard, I finally felt confident to follow my heart and pursue cannabis as my career. So I came to LA and started a community called Cannabis Feminist because in my heart, I believe cannabis could be the first billion dollar industry run by women. And just watching the female entrepreneurs come to life has been one of the best experiences of my life. And now I'm working on a line of hemp-derived cannabinoid product, wellness products because I really want to get cannabinoids into the hands of women all over the country who are taking Xanax and drinking white wine when they could be taking plant medicine. So that's why I'm here. The line is called Prima and I'm focusing on education first. Got my own. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Chelsea. Um, I'm actually a DJ. Um, and so I came uh, into this space um, through my own condition, uh, which is epilepsy. Um, I was diagnosed with a form of epilepsy called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy at the age of 15. Um, and epilepsy had already been a huge part of my life because I have an older sister with a more severe form of the condition. Um, and she lives in the UK and she lives in full-time care and she can have anywhere from, you know, five to 70 seizures a day and, and, and you know, often has grand mal seizures, falls to the floor without any warning at all. So, um, as I said, when I was diagnosed, I, you know, had, had already kind of, this condition had been something that um, I had experienced um, very intensely. Um, and I was put on pharmaceutical uh, medication uh, at 15, uh, a cocktail of different drugs. 
uh, which I experienced some pretty horrific side effects from. Um, for those of you that have taken anticonvulsants, you will know. Um, and uh, two years ago, um, I started to take CBD. Um, actually, it was over two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, and two years ago, I weaned myself off of all my pharmaceutical medication um, and have not had one seizure since. So, so I come into this space as a patient um, and, uh, and, you know, have really, uh, I in, in, in many ways, owe my life to this plant. So that is why I'm sitting here today. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Annabelle Manalo. I'm a developmental biologist and I was a government researcher for the last seven years. I was a lead scientist on the largest chemotherapy project in the world. Um, I like this because we all have a story and I think that ties us into this industry and I think that's why a lot of us are here. Uh, I had a son two years ago, and uh, he was born, had a stroke, and was having over 200 seizures a day. Uh, they removed 40% of his brain. We were told he would never walk, talk, you name it. Um, you know, ultimately, I was very conservative and never even looked into cannabis. I have a clinical trial certification. I'm like, hey, this is federally unregulated. I'm not trying this stuff. But as a mom, I got pretty desperate when I saw a six-month-old who couldn't do anything. I mean, he's six months old, still not smiling at you, not moving. And that's what led me to do my own research and study cannabis and eventually made my own CBD oil that I now have seven patents around and didn't tell doctors, didn't tell anyone, but my husband started giving it to my son. And he's two years old now, still missing 40% of his brain, but he has no developmental deficits. Um, so I'm in the space to, because I owe, I own, I owe this space, uh, you know, my research, my credibility, and I'm here today to advocate for it and to make good relationships and to really um, educate and help people understand why this is such a critical industry, not for the money, but for what it can do for this world. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My story is definitely not as cool as those ones. Um, I'll probably represent like a different uh, voice and opinion in some of this. I am a disabled vet, so equally owe much to uh, this plant. Wisconsin Ag World to military to Colorado at the right time, 2016, and started a small company helping like with the business aspect of this industry. Now also manage four different venture funds, and um, I mean, just last week I was in nine different countries in Europe doing this sort of work for licensing. So. When it comes to the CBD side, I'm so thankful for the possibilities of this, but I also know from an investment stand, sure, a legality stand, like how do we actually do this correctly? And I'd say a good 97, eight, nine percent of it is not necessarily doing it correctly. So it's trying to find the balance of business, cannabinoid science, and like endocannabinoid system research and actually helping patients, because at the end of the day, this is everything we do this for. All adults are patients too, once it's legal. But what we do now matters, and for a lot of these patients and their stories, the businesses are not representing this cannabinoid or like this industry correctly. And we're thinking, we gotta think long-term in our decisions for patients, not just today, but deeply intergenerationally. So, pleasure to be here. All right, so I, you know, I think with, uh, with CBD, you know, there has been a lot of information and it has been such the craze in the mainstream um, over really, five years, but in the past three years, we've really seen a development um, almost of an, an entirely side industry that's definitely a part of cannabis, uh, but it's become more known uh, almost as hemp-derived CBD, especially on a national level. Um, can you guys speak to your experience in the difference of hemp-derived CBD uh, to the flower-derived CBD, meaning deriving from uh, the plant of, of uh, the, when, it, when it is grown as since Amelia and grown as a, as a flower and not an industrial production. Either, yeah, however you'd like. And make sure to also hold it up. Uh, he wanted me to let you guys know to hold it up so everybody could hear. So what we're dealing with now is layers and layers of consumer confusion while also experiencing a huge surge and buzz around the term CBD without actually understanding what CBD is. 
in my opinion, we should stop calling it CBD and instead call it a cannabinoid. And the difference is, while I agree that CBD is a primary cannabinoid that we should really focus on, it's one of over 100 active compounds in the plant. And by calling it CBD, we're putting so much focus on a single molecule, we're forgetting about the entourage effect. The, the fact that the compounds need each other to activate and to work synergistically with the body. And I think that what's happening is we're almost showing consumers that we know more than we actually do because there's so much about the plant we do not yet understand. We don't understand how the terpenes and the phenols and the cannabinoids work together and how many receptors we have in our bodies. In fact, I was just in Israel this summer speaking to Dr. Raphael Meshulam, who first discovered the endocannabinoid system and isolated CBD and THC. And when I asked him about a potential third receptor found in the body, which was big news this summer, he was like, honestly, we have no idea how many receptors we have in our system. And part of the beauty and part of the magic with the plant is that there is a lot we do not yet understand. So as experts or advocates or users or patients, we have to do a lot of on the ground consumer education and we have to help people understand what they're actually looking for, which is a cannabinoid rich extract. It's not just CBD, it's not just an isolated molecule. It's a cannabinoid and active beyond cannabinoids extract coming from either the flowers of the cannabis or the hemp plant, as long as they're extracted from the flowers and not the seeds because now we're also seeing beauty products made with hemp seed oil, calling it hemp oil, calling it cannabinoids, which is doing a total disservice to the true benefit of the plant. So we need education. We need to start using the word cannabinoid more than using the word CBD, because that's also misleading. A single isolate is completely different effect than a whole plant full spectrum extract. So in my mind, it should really be a cannabinoid conversation and where we can get the best cannabinoids supported by phenols and, um, and terpenes and other, other molecules we do not yet understand. So just look for whole plant, full spectrum or broad spectrum, in my opinion. And so I 100% agree. There's um, this synergistic benefit that we hear about from a whole plant or a full hemp extract that you know, is profound, and we haven't been able to define it. But I think that's just as important is our, our lack of research. This industry has been moving for the last 25 years, and we're just ex extracting and extracting and extracting, but that single isolate is important because unless we isolate every single cannabinoid, we can't define the synergistic benefit. So we don't know if some of these... Uh, cannabinoids can turn into THC. We don't know what happens when it de gets decarboxylated and goes from an acid form into a single form. And most importantly, we don't know what happens when it enters into our body. So instead of just saying, hey, you know, everyone just go all in, go for a full hemp extract, I think we need to have better standardizations and understand what is in each hemp extract based on strain or whatever you want to base that on, make sure that the quality is right, and then start building up some data, even if it's data within the user itself. Like, hey, I, you know, I got fibromyalgia, I'm going to start trying CBD. Okay, I'm going to try a full hemp extract. What are the cannabinoids in there that we do know about? And what may have helped me? Unless we have you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people at data collection, we're never going to know what this synergistic benefit means. N not a lawyer, not a lawyer at all. I like them a lot though. Um, so I, I like to look at like the Controlled Substances Act that clearly defines like what is legal and what is not from like a controlled one substance. So it lists cannabinoids, all 117 known today. Um, CBD, THC, A, G, all of them, all the fun new ones. And when we look at like the Farm Bill, 2014 Farm Bill, I was probably the one who towed the fucking line the biggest on that with like a giant hemp project with like tribal reservations. You needed to essentially have like State Department of Agricultural approval and an institution of higher education that had the authority to work with the Farm Bill to cultivate hemp for the extraction thereof of seeds, fibers, holes, like not unpollinated female flowers, which we all know are so great. Um, anything that happened after that point, when you look at like 1961 UN conventions, uh, single conventions on psychotropic substances, even now like WHO last week had a pretty good new finding on this, but everything CBD is completely as illegal as THC. 
And without the Cole memo, you don't really, like, which doesn't really mean crap anymore, but we still follow those eight rules. It was really important. Um, you essentially like, could not be doing extraction as a business of CBD unless you had a state licensed medical cannabis operation for cultivation and extraction, but then you couldn't be selling like non-THC products like in Colorado is where we originated. So we started to test this. 2014, 15 is when they made the OLLS decision letter in Colorado that pretty much stated that unless it was derived from a state farm bill program or from a state medical cannabis program, you couldn't be doing this sort of thing. So it's all completely illegal. The 2018 farm bill, which it passes, is gonna really carve out some great new things for this. But from a business standpoint of the definition, you think um, cannabis and hemp, kind of same thing. Biological definition of a species, the ability to create sexually viable offspring, I believe, Bill Nye. Um, so cannabis, you've got like your Great Danes, your poodles, like hemp is the Great Dane, poodle, bulldog, shih tzus, mix them. Around the world, you've had 0 0.3, 0 0.4, or 1% based on these THC thresholds, which should have been THCA, but they didn't really understand the science there. So legality of like, you look at Endoka, Stanley Brothers, Bluebird, a few of those initial ones that some have now had Canadian IPOs for over 100 million Canadian, which is much less, so it's not as cool sounding, but um, they're doing some big things right now, but also when you look at the USDA and the EPA, USDA, when they issued the warning letters, also with the FDA to, it was like 94 CBD companies, like, hey, we tested your products, there's not even cannabinoids in them. That's horrible press and credibility for a molecule or something that's really doing amazing work that we're barely beginning to understand. But normally with CBD, when I look at it, it's like not interested. Because like from an investment standpoint, it's like market risk. It's not legal what they're doing. We already towed the line as an industry. So now the companies that are doing this correctly under state programs or hemp programs, like to actually create this medicine, hopefully if we don't have a standards program, patient-focused certification, like from the cannabis side, from Americans for Safe Access, does a great job for like cultivation, extraction, retail, GMP, GAP, Global Grab, like all those standards. But right now we're in this moment where we know it's helping people, we know the definitions, no one's following those rules practically other than a few companies. And it's like, how do we actually create new companies to help people knowing the rules? Well, touching on that, I know that um, California, Nevada, uh, Oregon, they are now requiring a hemp handler certificate when selling uh, CBD products. So basically, it's a traceability factor where you have to show where your hemp comes from. I don't know how you show whether you're extracting from the flower or stem. I, I would hope that we just do it. <laughs> but, um, you know, traceability leads to hemp, where that hemp is either shipped to or extracted, what that first uh, certificate of analysis shows, which cannabinoids, terpenes are present, as well as are there any microbials, pesticides, the whole nine. And then you have your final batch uh, testing, which also shows if someone says there's a thousand milligrams of CBD in there, is there really a thousand milligrams of CBD? Because when you have a full hemp extract or a whole plant, I think that's brilliant that you said we should call it a cannabinoid uh, product as opposed to a CBD product because with the way it is now, you're only really getting maybe 60, 70 percent CBD because it's so abundant in hemp. The rest of it is terpenes, other cannabinoids, so it's, it, it is a full extract. It's not really just CBD. Now, if it is 99.9 .9 percent CBD isolate, then call it a CBD product. You know, so that is you know, what is being required now in states such as California, Colorado, where marijuana is legalized, they're trying to kind of have the same standardizations besides, behind CBD. A lot of companies do not like it, but I think that, I think it's phenomenal. I think that, you know, as a consumer, when you're spending 200 bucks, 300 bucks on a product, you should get something you can trust. Yeah, no, and, um, you know, where, I where think Where do you sell those products, So Colorado, in all of those states then, even with a Department of Ag license for hemp, and a Department of Health license for extraction and like the handling, they can't actually sell those products in dispensaries in Colorado because the only things that can be sold in Colorado dispensaries or these other states are marijuana products through the like, so then they have to do the low CBD or the high CBD, low THC varieties through their cannabis operations, tracking metric, all those things to even have CBD products for sale in medical dispensaries or adult use. Well, but Nick, I would say, and I would argue that, you know, for the patient and actually for delivering medicine to the patient, that that is the framework that has been set by the regulatory agencies. It's the framework that actually allows uh, for the patient to get analytics that are guaranteed. Uh, and from the flower, and this would go to Chelsea as, as the patient, 
um, you know, experiencing hemp-derived CBD that you can buy at any store compared to what you're going to get out of a legal dispensary that in California is more or less going to be guaranteed to come from the flower. I do hear stories of dispensaries selling hemp-derived CBD, which is mindless to me, but people I have heard do that. But for the majority of our, especially our major brands, are going to be derived from the flower. And as a patient, what is your experience? Well, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I think it's always important as well to look at this as a sort of global issue, you know, and as, um, you know, I'm from England and I split my time between England. <laughs> I split my time between <laughs> England um, and New York. Um, and, uh, you know, due to my uh, geographical postcode, I'm lucky enough that I have a medical marijuana card. You know, I'm able to go and speak um, with a physician that I trust, have an open conversation with someone that's well informed. I can trust the product that I'm using, you know, that it's well regulated, that it's standardized, that it's pharmaceutical grade. Um, but, you know, when I uh, initially started um, using CBD, um, it was derived from hemp. I didn't know what I was using, where it come from. I didn't even know the difference between um, CBD from, from hemp versus whole plant until, and I, and I went down the road of self-medicating because um, my journey started in England where it's schedule one uh, and it's illegal. And um, now I've arrived at this point where, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using uh, product that I can trust. Uh, but let's not forget, when I get on the airplane with my, you know, one-to-one -one and my um, CBD, the whole plant, uh, you know, I'm breaking the law, which is the most ludicrous thing ever. Um, so uh, that in itself just, I think, almost, you know, sort of sums up the, the, the current landscape and where we're at. And it's always interesting for me to, to come to California and, you know, hearing these conversations and just seeing how far ahead we are. But we have to remember where the rest of the world is, you know. Um, I think one of the, the biggest issues that I'm seeing, I forgot to mention before that I'm uh, also making a documentary uh, that is uh, exploring the medicinal, medicinal cannabis climate with a focus on, on epilepsy. Um, through sort of the personal lens of, of, of my, my own experience and, and that of my sister. But, um, you know, my sister doesn't have access to this medicine. Um, she can't get on an airplane because she's too sick to travel. So until, um, you know, there is a product that has been clinically trialed, um, she has no chance of, of, of being able to, to use, you know, this, this as a form of, of treatment. Um, and so, uh, yes, now that I'm using um, a 20 to 1, you know, high CBD strain fr from whole plant, the difference is just incomparable. It, it, it's hard to sort of communicate that to someone perhaps that, that doesn't have epilepsy. But um, it, it's like I'm taking the medicine that I really should. You know, it's almost like a, it's a, a brain balancing uh, effect that... Um, using the, the product that really, really works, you know, for, for, for my brain and, and for my body. But one of the issues that I think that I'm seeing um, tremendously so in the UK um, is that, you know, because of all these beautiful anecdotal stories that people are reading in the media, um, it, it's creating this buzz we know around CBD and, and, and patients are going to their local organic whole food store and buying a bottle of CBD to treat their epilepsy and making really poor decisions and you know jumping off medicine and thinking that they're now taking this product that's going to treat their seizures and I think that there we see the importance of education and that you know and labeling and where is this product coming from and in the UK people aren't even having this conversation they're just at the point of wow this is a form of treatment that can treat seizures that's where we are in the UK so I just think it, 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 you know, it's so important just to, to really um, begin to educate people and, and about whole plant and the difference between uh, CBD from hemp. I also think we have to go, go a step further and actually uphold some of the same high standards from the natural foods industry or the natural products industry and carry that through the entire production and manufacturing product process because my fear coming from 10 years in the clean beauty industry, starting from the beginning and watching it evolve is that we're also doing a disservice to the plant by not formulating the products in, in a clean, sophisticated environment that upholds certifications and standards that we would feel comfortable with. Because it's great that you have to test the active, but what about the final product? What about any contaminants or chemicals or pesticides that have come in through the manufacturing process that is sometimes is happening in a home or in a facility that isn't 
up to our standards. So I just think that as the consumer and as the advocate, we also have to take a step further and actually make sure that the cannabinoids are housed safely within the final formulation without any pesticides or chemicals or industrial chemicals that are found in a lot of the products we put on our skin and in our bodies because I would hate for this true medicine to be hidden by ingredients that don't belong in our products. So, you know, I, I think one thing that this shines incredible light to uh, overall is that we still have a major problem with access and with a patient being able to get uh, access to the whole plant extraction. And, and maybe that is pointing to why uh, we found loopholes to find ways to extract from the legal source of hemp. Uh, however, we're hearing that it really isn't the true medicine uh, for the patient. And so, you know, what that could do is, is seriously discredit cannabis uh, moving into the world of research, moving into the world of medicine, um, and really also for the consumer. Uh, what is it that we can do uh, as an industry, and I think this may be pointed more to Annabelle, somebody that's really worked in the science world and on projects, um, what, what do we need to do to educate the researchers and the doctors that whole plant is really what they need to be sending their patients to, what they really need to be getting to do their research? How do we do that as an industry? Well, I think that, you know, as, as a patient, you need to ask your doctor and make them feel like idiots when they don't know anything about this plant because whether they like it or not, it's coming. And... Um, what I'm trying to do is reach out to my colleagues. I, you know, speak weekly to neuro, neuro, neurology, neurology teams, um, you know, former athletes, um, other doctors, cardiologists, oncologists. And, you know, there's just a lot of patients and parents that come to me that are just desperate for help and for knowledge. And ultimately, you know, when... When I decided to become a doctor, it was to have proper training and credibility to help people. And I think as, as doctors, we owe that to the people to have knowledge on, on, this, on this plant. But there's not any proper educational uh, courses set up and, and doctors are like, well, hey, this isn't federally regulated. I don't, I'm not gonna you know, vouch for it or I don't know anything about it. But when someone like me steps in the room and educates them on it, you know, their views change. And so, you know, I think as a patient, what you can do is ask your doctor about it. Be forward. Take a stand for your, for your own health. And, you know, and if you have any kind of power, whether you're a lawyer or whatever you are, you know, take, take a stand and, and, and push those that, you know, have credibility in this industry that can get research done to, to do that. I mean, you have to be a voice, and, and that's really all we can do. I mean, we can, we can form groups all day, advocate groups, but in, unless we really, like, you know, advocate for the research and advocate for the education, and, and, you know, it's not about telling your doctors, hey, prescribe whole plant. It's about telling your doctors, look, every person is different. We need to treat each individual as, a, as an individual patient. That's what we're doing in the medical industry. It's called precision medicine or personalized, customized treatment. We need to be just implementing cannabis in there the same way we implement any other medication because we have amazing modern technology. We have amazing plant resources, and we need to be able to put that together. And our problem right now is we're not bridging that gap. Uh how, how do you make a prescription of something that's not federally, like, so here in the United States, recommendations. So we can't, like, actually classify this in the same way. But for, the, like, those rules are, like, what we can do, like, as a business, an operator, a regulator, or a patient. Like, there's this little thing called, like, the American Herbal Pharmacopeia, like, kind of an old thing that talks about, like, pharmaceutical medicine derived from plants. Um, Germany is what illuminated my understanding of when I had to import. I normally would do GAP, GMP, like, GDP. Um, and then they're like, no, you need like GACP. I'm like, what the heck is that? And it's like good agricultural collection practices. So even though like cannabis is doing like agricultural production, like it's for how you would like dig roots in the forest and preserve those and process those or wild flowers for like, let's say saffron or so, like anything like that. So it's a new type of standard that's like international. Anyone like, since we're already sketchy, it's like any business, like follow normal business rules. So like American Herbal Pharmacopeia, GAP type good agricultural practices, good agricultural collection practices, GMP for like your oils and certifications and like manufacturing formulations, compounding. But even in your country, like 
for 3,300 US a year, or K a year, you could have your 2.5, 2.5 from some skunk number three derived you know, in the UK, but then like, that's for 2.5 and 2.5, and then like those sorts of companies, like when we're getting like the access to the doctors, and that's true prescription side, but then like their stock's almost $750 million right now for one product for like one small condition. Like that's where you get the access, but seven years of those trials, like titration, like doing this correctly, like that's the hard part because what people know of the CBD industry now, especially the medical industry, they see like these great case studies, but then it's like, well, like the studies aren't large enough. A lot of this is not like anecdotal. It's like not clinical science. We're funding, we've got some great medical representatives here that, I mean, some of the warriors out there, I mean, that one over there, it's like incredible to see what they've done or just like to mention Mishulam, but now with what we can do with this, we have to like have the business legal side that's correct with the pharmaceutical side and like realize like, what you said originally with the medical card, that's just a fucking Costco membership anymore. I mean, you're not paying the adult use excise tax. You can maybe grow a few more plants. It's like, if you buy at least an ounce a year, it makes sense to still pay your doctor. But then most doctors, you're like, go talk to your doctor. Think about like Dr. Feelgood down on Venice Beach where it's like, oh, my medical patient, my, my wrist hurts. And it's like, many of those doctors have no idea that have actually made the initial recommendations. And so, like Canicare docs, there's a few that can help it. It's like, which doctors do we educate because... But I, so, so I would be curious, though, just after, you know, hearing from Chelsea and, and understanding that, you know, as a medicine, it really is better to have a, a 1 to 12 or a 1 to 20, uh, you know, with THC blended from the flower plant. Uh, in the industry and from the clients that you work with, uh, is there a a want to enter into the, the legal market and the commercial market of cannabis to provide CBD uh, in the legal markets? Or is it that, no, the path of hemp uh, without having to deal with licensing is a much better investment and it, and it makes so much more money that that's just where the money's gonna stay uh, until we have maybe a full all national legalization. But is there any interest that you're hearing uh, of people that wanna get into uh, whole plant CBD extraction instead of the hemp derived? Huge. I mean, there's probably 150 million right now of CapEx investments I know about in the United States with like West Virginia projects or large extraction. Kentucky, like the wildest wild market. It's really like the best laws for legality. Kentucky's like, fuck you is what their law is pretty much. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's legal to export it out of state lines. And it's like, well, but once you're out of Kentucky, your rule doesn't really apply anymore. Um, I am absolutely, as an individual, as entities and people are, but there's too much risk with a lot of the US CBD companies right now. Um, just like the state to state, the legal ambiguity. But I think of like one thing I'm looking at deeply right now is like fibromyalgia, $22 billion market share last year. And when we think about cannabis derived products taking up to 10% of that market by 2027, projected to be about 28 billion, 10% of 28 billion, that's 2.8 billion. There's five companies doing clinical trials right now. One sucks, one's mildly sucking, one's doing great. And the other two are like, oh, they haven't released yet. Like, of course, those initial investments, like to capture that much market share to help that many patients, great. The problem is the companies doing it are like, I'm not saying GW Pharma, good, bad, ugly. I don't like to trash companies unless it's Tilray. But, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's a lot of others worth trashing. But that company for that medicine, derived from a not even very good variety, like Epidex Sativex, like the cost of like pharmaceutical companies getting that, that can afford the research. Like, I'm just scared that the ones that are interested in investing into the real of this industry, are going to be the ones that control it and then don't allow safe, like affordable access, other than just like a different tax rate for like, I have a medical card. I mean, Colorado medical cards peak like 130-ish K and like now they're like around 80,000 just for a few more plants and less taxes. California is the same way, but like we have to remember the medical basis of this, but there's a lot of investment interest, but not in like, hey, I make these products in CBD and I used to do THC and I couldn't get legal in that. Now I have all the stuff and I extract and I blow stuff and now I do it from hemp or low varieties. Um, it's, it's all gonna be changing over the next two to five years based on too many shitheads fucking it up right now for the people who actually need it from a business investment standpoint. And, and so you are saying then that, yeah, we're gonna see a shift in the investment to wanna get into the legal commercial world with CBD because I think that, you know, that, that it's causing a disservice major, mainly to the consumer and especially at a time when so many people are embracing uh, CBD as a whole uh, and there's places to get it and, and we refer to it almost commonly as snake oil because you're, you're sending a patient or a doctor is sending a patient uh, to an open consumer market to buy something over the counter
encounter uh, that isn't truly what it is. And, um, you know, what can we do? And, and I think from a patient's perspective, Chelsea's story really shines light to it. And what we need to educate the consumer. And, um, you know, Annabelle talked about uh, the, you know, the doctors and the researchers, but what is it that we all do, uh, Jessica, as, as a company that's producing hemp-derived CBD, but knowing from the patient that clearly it's better from the whole plant, how do we get that through to the consumer? And, and what, what can you do f from your point of view? I think before we start talking about what to invest in, we should talk about the fact that most of us don't invest in ourselves enough. And the issue is that we can say talk to doctors, but doctors aren't taught about the endocannabinoid system in medical school. So the doctors actually aren't the experts in the room. And in my eyes, functional medicine isn't enough until people learn to listen to their bodies before they listen to the advice of doctors. I got started in this space because I met this girl named Tani Shaw who was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer and given six months to live. And she shook her head at her doctor and she said, no, you won't tell me how much longer I have to live. And she found cannabis oil early um, and kept herself alive for almost four years until she was ready to go. And so in my mind, the conversation starts from within, and it's actually empowering people at a young age to actually listen to themselves, listen to not just their intuition, but their bodies, and understand when something's off, and actually work towards prevention, because I'm a patient, we're all patients if we believe in the plan and if we use it, and I think there's a major blurred line between what it means to be a social user and a medical user when we could all probably acknowledge that the plant makes us feel good, which is an extension of health and happiness. So in my mind, it's just all the rest is noise. Even sometimes what the doctors are saying is noise. And what we, we should be teaching people from an early age is to listen to our bodies, trust plants over pills, at least initially, do have enough faith in nature to do a little bit of experimentation, realize that you are your own guinea pig and best advocate. So it might take a few high nights, you know, pass out, go to sleep, eat some snacks. It's not the end of the world. If you see what's happening on the pharmaceutical side, what doctors are giving you before they trust the plant, and the things that pa patients experience initially up front when they're diagnosed with cancer or any of these horrendous illnesses, it's, it's just, it's crazy. And I think that we all have an innate responsibility to use our personal knowledge and experience with the plant to teach people to listen to their bodies, Sometimes you have to trust something beyond medical advice and, and trust the mysticism of the world and just keep trying because that's what we're all here for. Yeah, just to, to, to add to that, I think sometimes we underestimate, um, you know, the power of, of our own experience, as you were saying. And I think, um, you know, it's very easy to be intimidated by, uh, you know, our, our physicians and perhaps for someone like myself that comes from a patient standpoint, okay, so I don't speak that language. And so, you know, when I was, I must have been in my teens when I went to my neurologist and I said, um, I've seen this video, uh, it was the Charlotte's Web video, that was the first time I ever, you know, learned anything about uh, medicinal cannabis, uh, and he laughed in my face. Um, and had I have listened to my doctor, I wouldn't be sitting here um, two years seizure-free uh, off pharmaceutical medicine with no side effects. I was suicidal on that medicine. That medicine ruined my life, and I'm off it. It has changed my life. And I think, when I say we underestimate that, you know, we have to believe in ourselves, as, as Jess was saying, and I think, you know, Sorry to bring it back to the UK, but again, looking, you know, I'm sure many of you have read about this little boy um, called Billy Caldwell and his mother, Charlotte. We've been following them for the documentary. And she is honestly, you know, one of the most incredible activists out there right now because she said no to her doctor and she said no to conforming. And the government, you know, they tried to take the medicine away. And she said, I have three weeks of medicine left. This is my son's medicine. This stops his seizures. They, you know, they, they refused. She, she, she challenged the government. She got on a plane to Canada and she brought his medicine back through Heathrow. The medicine was then seized and her son went into hospital. And it was because of her bravery and her fight. And she didn't give up and she said, you know what? I know that I could get this medicine and keep my mouth shut just like the other little boy, Alfie Dingby in the UK did. But she said, I am doing this for all the other little boys and little girls and other patients in the United Kingdom. And because of her bravery, 
the, U, the, the, the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, announced that the UK is rescheduling cannabis. Now, that is humongous, obviously, because it moves from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2, and that, you know, is the beginning. But then you have the issue of, so now, you know, they've announced this rescheduling. People think they have access to this medicine. People are applying for license. They're getting denied because the doctors have, they ha they've had no education. A doctor isn't going to suddenly go from knowing nothing about medicinal cannabis to prescribing it. As you said, they don't know about the endocannabinoid system. So I think it is our job as, as patients, as people in this industry, first of all, to remember, I think there's so much excitement around, you know, investment and the business side, but to remember that we are here because of the patients. And this is you know a movement that needs to be led by by the patients by science you know not by politics um, and so I think you know if we can go to our doctors and say how we feel you know if I can go to my neurologist and say I feel different using a one-to-one -one or a CBD from whole plant versus CBD isolate if I can present the you know some research if I can look at other other um, you know, even anecdotal stories, I think that does carry weight because we see these, when you tug on the heartstrings, that's what sparks change. And, and you see that now happening in the UK. So I think we have to believe in ourselves and uh, use our experience to, to you know, spearhead this, this, this change and this movement. I also quickly want to call out um, Jeff Chen, who's actually creating educational materials that will be distributed um, among medical schools. And so there are a lot of young researchers who are super hungry and committed to not just the patients, but to training doctors and medical professionals. And that's happening at UCLA. Well, one of my questions like with that, and I, I, I agree with all, all that you just said there, um, but like who funds medical research? Like companies, and this is really sad, like as a patient, I. The dreaming side of this industry, I love it, and like I come from it, but then I saw it all like leading to crap and never getting done, and then like all the concepts not happening. So, it's like patients equal clients, clients equal revenue, revenue equals business. Without serving my patients as like actual clients, I don't have a business. If I don't have qualifying conditions in a market or a state that can buy my product, if they're just doing like an epilepsy study and they didn't do pain, like which they should have maybe because their market share would have been huge, but it would have been too much to take on at one time. But it's like we need the businesses to actually serve the patients, but we can't do this without the businesses because the businesses doing it were so shitty and misrepresenting this and not scaling. Like I'm not a, I'm a biologist, farm dude. Like this is a little new over the last decade here. But without robust, good quality businesses that can raise capital and have investors interested in a product, like that don't show crazy market risk or like the team's insane, like the Stanley Brothers to see what they've done over the years, like from Colorado and the roots to now, it's like, it's impressive, but like that's one out of a thousand type stories. But then they're gonna turn into a business now that's gonna make medicine for how many? Some of the past violations and lawsuits might come back and hurt them for like past violations, but that would be long-term things. But it's the businesses that can do it, but we need the patients to ask and like also like vote with your dollars when it comes to these products. Like if you don't buy crappy products from companies, they go out of business. So like knowing, I'd love to see like patient advocacy groups that like actually like went with testing and said like, these are actually the products that are not crap that we know of today. And these are the ones that are total crap to stay away from. Like I would love to see a source for that too for patients. I, I think though, you know, and I completely agree. I think that that's absolutely what we need. But I think that what that is, is essentially your commercial licensed cannabis producers. Uh, and and it, I think it's a, there's a very clear division between your commercial cannabis producers uh, and hemp derived CBD. Um, and I think that that's, you know, we're hearing that from patients. I hear it from patients every day at Tahoe Wellness that uh, have gone down the road of kind of getting hemp derived CBD uh, from typical stores and, and then they come back to, you know, a, a 20 to one or even a one to one, whatever it is. And, and there's a clear difference and as Chelsea told us. So how, you know, one of the things is, is how do we, after this huge investment and, and all of this is going into hemp derived CBD, um, is there talk about what is the transition, which there's a very great and natural transition for uh, all the hemp fields that are being planted, which is a great thing, and the farm bill that's going to come. Is that discussion starting to happen, the transition into textiles, into industrial hemp, uh, so that these investments can transition and not be uh, at a total loss when this is realized by the consumer? I mean, like four years ago, that big hemp project, I was like taping discs, like seeding discs to like it was a vegetable seeder, like vacuum seeder to plant these things in rows because like no hemp discs were in the United States because it's been illegal forever. Um, 
And I realized that I'm like, wow, the US hemp industry that everyone's gonna talk about and loves, which will be huge and robust someday, was still at that point a quarter billion dollars shy of initial infrastructure for decorders, redders. And then I kept seeing all these producers grow huge hemp fields in Colorado and have all of these material and be like, what do we do with this now? How do we dry this? Like, oh shit. Uh, and then like trying to import it and move it. The, the shift I really see though that already has been discussed though with this sort, once it's a legalization is a question of when especially like with our farm bill with certain pieces, but the hemp side will get huge, but we need copious amounts of investment because most of like the Canadian, most of the Chinese, most of like those, like for the products, it's just like, we can do this. This is like a seven, $800 million annual industry now, but just think we're all wearing clothes. We all need protein sources. We all need like, it's gonna be enormous, but I like using the cannabis side to fund that side. But for hemp derived CBD or like cannabis derived I mean, based on Colombian law right now, I work deeply international, being able to export bulk oils and like on the equator for, it doesn't matter, cost of production in the United States, like most of the cannabinoids from like hemp derived or like cannabis derived, once federally legal and these things are happening, will be coming from Colombia. Um, even though well, we can grow great hemp here and in Canada, but like it's just low cost of production, cannabis varieties, it's about cost of production when it comes to business, if it's allowed for the import side. Well, but, you know, Canada, uh, just recently, Tilray will be providing cannabis for research here in the U.S., and uh, they will be bringing What, NIDA's, CBD. NIDA's cannabis wasn't quality enough for Well, them? and it's ridiculous. I completely agree. But CBD whole plant-derived cannabis oils are going to be available on the global market from Canada. So well, I think they that are even currently from actually 11 other countries. There's 27 countries that allow import, 21 actually doing it actively. Right, so the, the idea... Not of just hemp, from Canada. Like the, they were the idea first, of, but... The, the idea of hemp-derived CBD, I mean, don't, don't you think that that further shows the consumer when there's availability of whole plant from legal countries? We're not one of those legal countries yet, but I think that just furthers that point, you know? And, and so I guess my point here is how, how do we get those investment diverted to where they should be, which is textiles and not medicine? Uh, the industrial the, the industrial grown hemp is what I refer well, to. I, I know that um, in the state of Kentucky and Tennessee, um, they are putting millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into, uh, it's like a, I don't know anything about tractors, but it's a, a double cut technology where they're able to, at harvest time, they're able to get the flour for the oils and the resin, um, but also get the, the stock as well so that you can utilize the whole plant. I mean, hemp has over 2,500, I think more, uses. And so to look at it as just medicine or to uh, grow it only for the medicine part or only for the textiles part is wrong. I mean, if we're going to put a ton of money into this, we should try to definitely use the whole plant. So I know that in Tennessee and Kentucky, there's a lot of money, a lot of big corporations uh, going behind that. But I, I don't know the business side of the rest of the country. One to two million is like a, tr a combine. And then you look at like the 10 million investment for a decorder redder there, like hemp's amazing, but like to do industrial manufacturing, biggest hemp stuff in the United States will be mostly like where you can grow hemp based on like 25 to 35 inches of annual precip, daytime high, nighttime low. You look at like the Iowa's, the Minnesota's, Wisconsin's. Um, but like those sorts of instruments, the, the problem is we, Tennessee, I have clients in Tennessee, hemp farmers, so they, and like even last year thinking, oh, hemp's really high in CBD, that's bullshit. I've grown like varieties that were like 0.02% CBD and you're like, wow, that five acres isn't even worth doing anything with. And then if it's a cannabis side, like we actually have to like grind all the stalks and like it's amazing the amount of like biomass we have to destroy based on either being medical cannabis or hemp side. And if it's really high like potency, the genetics, like then it's worth extracting. But I, I can't even touch for a CBD extraction something less than 3% commercially to make it viable. Um, at least on industrial scale, but you're right. Like those places are gonna grow copious amounts. Most of them just, they don't have anywhere to send it or use it right now. And then it actually dissuades a lot of farmers to keep planting it because like, what do you do with it? And then one male plant, have you seen a 15 foot tall male hemp plant? Like it changes everything when it comes to whole plant extraction because then you're no longer unpollinized or even if you're doing feminized, your neighbor 10 miles away with his horny boys, they fucking find those virgin girls in, <laughs> It just, you can, it's, hemp pollen is insane. So the states that allow it all, you look at Pueblo in Colorado, they wouldn't allow male outdoor plants in the hemp or cannabis industry. Only like outdoor feminized because Sal Pace, like from a revenue standpoint, realized that like, hey, if we're trying to do major oil extraction in these places for hemp CBD and others, like we can't let the boys anywhere in the county. Yeah. 
So, so um, Annabelle, I wanted to talk to you about the, the CBD oil that you made, which uh, I believe you said was in Tennessee when you were, when you were doing that. So what was the process that you took, and, and a, especially um, if you're comfortable with talking with, you know, using it with your child and, and kind of understanding uh, the effects and, and how that went? Sure. So I learned quickly that, um, you know, my focus when I was in school, uh, I was in medical school first, and I learned quickly that every patient is different, and we're treating, you know, patient A with lung cancer the same way we're treating patient B with lung cancer, and that's absolutely wrong. Um, so then I went towards a PhD because I wanted to understand more about the disease, more about why we, uh, you know, formulate medications the way that we do, and you know that all I think came down to help me when it when it um, when I had a son who, you know, was in an emergency situation. Uh, so when formulating for him, I started educating myself. Obviously, first thing was the endocannabinoid system. I didn't know if I wanted to try THC or CBD or any of that. But what I ended up doing was doing a genetic test on my own son. And I found out that with him, I thought that CBD alone as an isolate would replace his medications. Now, I've worked with different CBD extracts and other cannabinoids, and you know that doesn't work for every epilepsy child, but, and I'm gonna say child because, you know, that's what's most dear to me. But for my own son, uh, a, a very potent isolate, um, I felt was going to replace the five medications that he was on. And so it was kind of scientific calculation, to be honest. Um, I also looked into the delivery. You know, currently we use a lot of coconut oils, palm oils, MCT oils. Um, I wanted something that would potentially have a better absorption rate because those oils, we know they're good for us, but then you have digestion problems because that is a lot of fat. And if you think about using fat as a delivery system, once you break it down, how much bioavailability do you have? What's the absorption rate? Where does the CBD go? How much did we metabolize? Um, so actually, my patents are not necessarily around extraction. Um, they're around delivery and formulation and protocol because another problem that you have with any products like let it be turmeric or whatever you want to call it, anything in an oil, is the dispersion rate. So is every drop the same? Do we have five milligrams in every single drop? And these are things that we learn, you know, when, when, we're, when we're doing clinical trial certifications. We learn how to make things properly. And, you know, even though I think it's really important that we listen to our bodies, man, that's number one on the list. Uh, you know, we need to change the view of doctors from being so so stuck to these protocols and to be more open-minded and understand that every patient is different. Every patient might need different formulations. One might need one to one, might, one might need 20 to one. And, you know, and a lot of it has to do with being in tune with yourself, you know, and, and doctors need to be more, more, you know, more like somebody to come to and talk to and work with opposed to, all right, that's wrong with you. Here you go. You know, so my specific formulation was, you know, for my son, and uh, it worked very well for him. And I'm seeing it work for a lot of people. I, I feel like CBD is obviously better with other parts of the plant. We haven't defined those other parts of the plant, so it's tricky. It, it's kind of a risk. It's a good risk because cannabis doesn't hurt us. But, you know, just my scientific mind, I, I, I really have been an advocate for CBD alone, THC alone, mixing the two. Um, and, and doing research to figure out what the, what the other benefits of, of the other molecules are. Um, and, and so that's kind of been the focus. I, I really want to um, mention as well, I'm working with the president of the American Pharmacy Association to make an accredited uh, continuing education course for both pharmacists and doctors. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, we don't be, oh, say no to your doctor, don't even go to a doctor, but to, to stand up for, for medicine in a way that, to, to help change the way that, that we, we do medicine, because medicine's important, and it's never going away, and biopharm's important, and it's worth billions of dollars, and it's never going away. So unless we educate ourselves and, and uh, you know, be better patients, instead of fighting, let's find a way to work together. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was so great. So I think we're, uh, we're going to have some Q&A, and uh, Susan is here, and we'll take it from there. 
Yeah, first, uh, thanks guys for, uh, for showing up. Um, really impressed with the knowledge you have as far as um, what's happening from a scientific level, especially around cannabinoid-based research. But my question specifically, we talked a lot about the plant uh, today. From the standpoint of you know, having worked in a company that worked on the uh, biosynthetic and um, uh, biocatalytic side of this, uh, Annabelle specifically for you as a medical background, is you know, where do you see the, uh, the industry going when I think about the bifurcation of the industry between the scientific side and the medical side away from like, the adult use recreational or even like, the nutraceutical side? Is where do you see the, um, the pharmacy industry going um, with biosynthetics, biocatalytics, and um, synthetic biology in general to produce cannabinoids that are um, you know, identical and actually produced through a, a biological enzymatic process rather than just through a plant extraction? Yeah, so that's a fight. Um, you know, we, we, we've made a lot of money on the pharmaceutical side with synthetics and, and making things, I call it plastic. Um, and I really don't think, and what, from what I see, I really don't think that most of the pharmaceutical industry is interested in setting up greenhouses and doing it the plant way. Um, to be honest. And so, you know, that's the fight. Um, other parts of the world are doing it right. Israel's doing it right. Canada's about to do it right. Germany. Um, but on this side, I, you know, from what I, I've seen and what I know, I cannot see the pharmaceutical side thinking that they'll make enough money off of setting up greenhouses and big extractors. And be, because of, imagine how big these extraction units have to be to push out a million products a month. So, no, I mean, if, if we're going to fight anything, it's going to be that. So you think that's a negative, then, that they're going down that road? I do think it's a negative. Synthetics are not the same as a whole plant. We need to. Yeah, you, 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 yeah I'm, I'm, to. you see the problems with that, like when you see the side effects of the synthetic side, but then also like some of the research we've been looking at from like also like the insulin side of, like they're looking at it from all angles to make it easier. But I think we'll also find like there's something about biomimicry and like cost that the plant will still, I think, be involved deeply. Okay, this is our last question. Hi, sorry. Um, if you guys can give me a recommendation, this was a great um, panel. I had a medical situation eight months ago. I had brain surgery because I found out I had a brain tumor. And through the medication that they did give me, um, part of it from a seizure standpoint, I agree with you, I don't like the side effects and everything that I'm going through that the doctor had prescribed. And I did talk to the doctor about CBD, and he wasn't quite giving enough information. So what type of um, research I should do to determine what type of CBD I should take in regards to the prescribed medicine that I'm taking from the hospital or from the doctor? So that's a hard question. Um, CBD is going to be safe for you with a lot of research that I've been reading. There are um, good, there's solid research showing that THC is uh, very beneficial for the brain mixed with CBD. And the reason being is that THC works a lot like the opioids and a lot, a lot like these psychoactive drugs that we have um, in a way that it binds directly to neurons. So when you've had any kind of brain damage or injury, you've lost a lot of neuroprotectivity, which means you've lost a lot of your simple signaling senses. Um, CBD is more of a catalyst or an activator, and that's why we don't get high when we take CBD. And together, you know, not only do we reduce the psychoactivity of THC, but it's almost like, it's almost like you're, you're putting a stop to something and holding it in place so that CBD can come and react and, and work on the problem, if that makes sense. Um, I always tell people, you know, to, to try a CBD with THC. Um, and then you got to kind of just, if you don't have proper you know, somebody proper to talk to or a doctor to go to. I mean, you can take my number. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it really, this industry, we're, we're in a growing position to where we can't look at you and say, take CBD one-to-one, -one. take CBD one-to-two. I mean, she discovered what works for her. That may not work for you. What works for my son doesn't work for several other children. 
And so I think the best thing about you being here is that you're here and that you're willing to utilize cannabis and try what's going to be best for you, um, whether it is to wean off the medications or to work with them. Um, you know, you're in a good place. So, yeah, you can get my number after the show. Uh, also, just to add to that as well, is that the, um, with my work, with uh, w uh, making this documentary, a lot of people have started to come to me, um, you know, through social media, through my website, and asking these same questions, you know, which way do I turn? And I think that um, with the buzz and the excitement of... Um, this industry and, you know, um, CBD as a form of treatment for, some, for a condition like epilepsy. Um, I, I feel that um, there is so much out there, as you were saying, in regards to it, it being like snake oil and people don't know which way to turn. But, I, you know, the number one thing that I always tell patients is, you know, introduce it with your medicine. Never, ever give up your medicine. Always introduce it um, and see how you feel for, for yeah, for a while, because um, abruptly stopping your uh, current pharmaceutical medis medicine is a uh, you know, recipe for disaster, obviously. So. And, and one little thing to add to that is just to uh, you know, find your local licensed dispensary and, and go there to try to find you know, full whole plant extraction. In California, uh, that's where you're going to find it instead of going to you know, a natural food store or somewhere where it's uh, available from hemp derived. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been such a great event. Uh, Susan is amazing. And um, yeah, it's going to be another great panel to go. And thank you all again. Mm -hmm.